Right, who am I? Um, basically, I just tinker and hack around, you know, I just hack around with stuff. Um, I do work in IT though, but I'm a support guy mainly. Um, I, I'm basically part of Humbug, which is Brisbane's UG, Unix user group, not LUG, which most people seem to forget, and <laughs> we do all Unixes, so, including proprietary ones like Mac OS, so. Um, why record talks? Well, for the reasons stated there, I mean, people who are unable to come is a great reason because that a lot of people couldn't come to Perth this year so it's good for them um, it's also a good record um, you know because basically that's there forever and you can go back in time and see what's been you know how technology has evolved you can see like first implementation final implementation um, also in the current state of the union at least for this conference in PyCon AU uh, is mainly they're using DV switch at the moment, which is basically a mix software mixer. So it switches between different sources that feed into it. Um, it's good for on-the-fly editing and streaming, which is the reason most people use it. Because um, you base and it's very easy for people to set up and use. I mean, um, you don't need to give much training. You just basically say press some keys every now and again when the when there's a slide or when there's a presenter. So it's pretty easy in that way. Um, but it is limited to the DV format. Um, its whole architecture is based on DV, so it's kind of very, very difficult to upgrade it to handle anything more than basically standard def 480p. So um, that's a big limitation of it. Uh, and it's currently using, of course, we're using the twin packs here, which are um, VGA only, and well, they got composite in as well. Um, and DV over IEEE 3094 Firewire. So that's, I mean, there is still there in the professional circles, but it's becoming less and less common now that there's other formats. And so what are, what are we doing? Well, at least what I'm doing at Humbug about it, <laughs> trying to anyway, um, is we're using HDMI now. I mean, uh, so we're actually using the Blackmagic cards from a company called Blackmagic Design. Uh, they're a Victorian company. Uh, they make some really nice hardware, actually. They've got some hardware switches, um, basically uh, lots of professional products, but they also make some nice, um, I suppose, prosumer level stuff, I suppose you'd call it. Um, basically, they're PCI Express capture cards um, that have HDMI in, and actually some of them have SDI in as well, which is nice. Um, and basically, they can capture HDMI t um, in basically 1080p, which is nice. 10-bit um, 10 10 -bit resolution, but that's still very good. Um, if you don't know anything about that, I'll, I'll cover that later. It's a bit probably without out of the scope of this, but um, yeah. So in the PC that we're using, I mean, this okay. The hardware in it is about uh, say it is about two hundred dollars. Um, well, this case, this is actually a Leanne Lee case. If we went for the case that we are going to go for, which is a cheaper one. Uh, it would be about $200 because the motherboard is very cheap. So it's a Celeron system. It doesn't really need that much. Um, it's actually decent for a Celeron. It's only 2. Point, it's 2.7 gigahertz dual core. So it can handle dual thread. Um, 2 gig of RAM. So um, mainly because the PC is actually not doing much encoding. That's the big reason why you don't need a great amount of hardware. Initially, we were using Core i3s and, and Core i5s. Uh, but in our testing, we found that's a bit overkill for what we're doing because these cards actually just feed in raw, basically raw video. So it's not really doing much to it, except for the, except for what it is converting it to DV, but that's not really that intensive. So um, I'll explain that in a minute. Um, yeah, and basically, so the laptop. Basically, we can compensate for VGA laptops by just converting it from VGA into um, HDMI. And um, yeah, it's basically, and the audio, we split it off um, from via the, out of the HDMI with an extractor and fit it through a mixer before we fit into the PC just so we can get the audio levels correct. Um, yeah, basically these are the cards that we, this one came out recently, like in April last year, and it's half, half height, which is really nice because you can actually make nice small PCs with it. Um, it's got SDI in, which is nice because you can use, like, from professional cameras, you can use SDI in. It's also got 10-bit HDMI in as well. Uh, and there's a complementary product. That's a DeckLink mini recorder. There's also a mini monitor, which is essentially a sort of a video card. So it'll output a HDMI signal. And, you, and there is actually G-Streamer plugins for that. You can use it as a sync 
which is really nice. Um, and that's the one we were using originally, which is the Intensity Pro, which is a bit more expensive, uh, but it has a lot of analog inputs, which, well, we don't use because we're using HDMI, but it does have the recorder and the monitor function that, those, that you need two products for that. So it depends on what you want to use it for, but we found that these ones are perfect, and they're cheaper, so, and they're half height, so. Um, this PC is just using stripped down Ubuntu 12.04 LTS um, on USB, and the reason for that is um, if something goes wrong with the software, the image corrupts or something like that, we can just pop in a new stick. Um, the actual video is being recorded onto a hard drive inside the PC, so that's um, so the video will always be there, even if you know because our software will be intelligent enough to. Uh, to tell, you know, basically whether it's been used previously or not. Um, that's still work in progress, though. Um, we're using, basically, um, at the moment, we're still using DVSwitch. <laughs> that's going to be changed very soon. Um, we are saving the streams as raw streams via a GStreamer. Um, actually, via, I've modified DVSource um, V for two other, which is Tim Ansel's one, but I turned it, just put DeckLink support in there and also teed it off so it actually just saves the raw video as well. So it's handy later on if you want to re-edit it. We got the, we got the 1080p stuff. Um, but DVSwitch just does what it does very well. That's the reason that we're using it at the moment because it's, um, we're trying to come up with something similar. Um, Opencast Matterhorn, which is actually a very good piece of software. It's a scheduling um, processing um, upload software. So it's basically a server that basically takes in the video, um, takes a number of operations, um, does a number of things to it, like adds titles, re-encodes it, um, uploads it to YouTube, or uploads it to its own um, its own media module, which I'll show you. Um, and um, yeah, and we're using Pika, which is a capture agent. Um, basically, the server's Matterhorn. Um, a capture agent's basically, this, this, it runs on basically this capture PC and it basically just receives a schedule from Matterhorn, like you schedule a recording in it. It goes, it goes, okay, at this time I've got to record this. So it records the video, then when it's finished it just uploads it to the server so the server can process it. Um, and to do live streaming, which is still work in progress. So that's actually an idea of how Matterhorn, that's actually from their website, it's actually very not bad. Um, you can actually manually upload, you can automate a capture, schedule, um, ingest and processing. So you can actually do slide analysis which is through OCR, which is actually not a bad idea. Um, <laughs> I think that's pretty cool, but we haven't tried it yet. Uh, workflow encoding, that's what we're, that's basically the list of operations to turn it into things. Um, branding and captioning, you can basically put captions in your video and stuff if you want. Uh, then you can actually distribute it, so you can either store it on your local servers, pop, pop it up to YouTube, or or I, even iTunes Play, um, and you can basically integrate it with other other things like um, you can put a, a player basically in other modules like you know, they got like Drupal and stuff like that, Facebook and WordPress. So it's actually pretty nice in that way. Uh, also got one of DV Switch. So that's an older version of DV Switch, but basically you have different sources. So camera, camera. Um, the black one's audio um, because. It's just the architecture of it. Uh, yeah, and basically you just use keys on the keyboard or you can just click on to switch. That's how easy it is basically to do on the fly editing. So, uh, the good. Um, capture cards, they're well supported. Um, the manufacturer actually releases updates a lot, um, constant updates to their software um, for Linux, which is really good. Um, Matterhorn's very mature. I mean, it's been around since, I think, 2010, I think. So. It's been supported by a number of universities, so it's actually very actively developed, and there's a lot of bug fixes and stuff for it, because um, there's a number of universities like uh, University of California, San Diego, I believe, use it, so. Uh, no, it's actually UCLA. Um, <laughs> close enough, same, same uni, just different campus. Um, yeah, and it's basically, and it's very easy to, the language, even though it's like an XML file, it's quite intuitive, because it basically starts with like operation, operation, operation. So um, there's different modules, so you just call different modules um, and it just you, works by just re-tagging everything. So when something's done, it just changes, converts tags from one to another. So the next module, um, that's just so you can actually skip parts of it if you don't want, you know, certain videos don't have to go through certain parts of processing because if they don't have the right tags for a certain step, they won't get processed by that step. But it's good because Basically, you can encode a video for YouTube, and you can encode a video for its own built-in media module, um, basically using the same workflow. So, 
uh, and, and doing two different videos in different formats and resolutions, which is, which is nice. Um, basically, uh, the BAD um, uses non-free kernel modules. Uh, that's the ba only bad thing I can... That's about with these Blackmagic cards is they're... Um, yeah, they're very nice, well supported by the vendor, but they're like NVIDIA and stuff. They're basically... A, but apart from that, they've got the GStream plugins are all free, open so source. Um, so they've got a Decklink source. Uh, Decklink's the API that these um, cards use. So they have Decklink source and Decklink sync. So, uh, and it's all raw video, which is lovely. Um, Matterhorn's written in Java, so you do need a lot of horsepower. Well, it's not horsepower, it's more RAM, really, because I've found that if you don't have enough RAM, it just, it'll crash. Um, and that's not good when you're doing, um, you're having multiple captures going on, you know, multiple ingests, um, uploads of video in there, like, basically your server crashes. That's not really good. So you do need to keep lots of RAM up to it, otherwise, it, that's just Java, though. <laughs> and DV switch is the only bad thing, actually. It's a good and a bad thing, because uh, it's still standard def. Uh, future, work in progress, mention that. Um, we'll be replaced with a HD alternative, possibly Lando. I'll give you, that's basically Lando, which is made by, oh, sorry. That's, it's made by like Spanish people. It's a bit orphaned at the moment. It hasn't been updated since, I think, like 2011. So, but it's, its interface is actually quite nice because you have, it also does nice pick and pick as well, but you've got your video sources down here. You've got your effects. You can actually do text on screen. And you can do output as well. So you can actually... Um, output to file, output to streaming, like Icecast, for example, all in one application, which is really, really nice. Um, it does have a few, like its pipeline, it's, it uses GStreamer, and it's written in Python, um, but it's a bit, uh, at the moment, it does need a bit of cleaning up. Its pipelines are a bit um, clumsy, how, how, how should I say, but it's just, we're, we're working on that, um, but at the moment, we're using DV Switch until that's ready enough to fix, so we, we're kind of unorphaning it by taking it over a bit. Um, but yeah, it's um, basically also, we would love to have USB 3 or Express card capture devices that at the moment don't ex uh, they exist, but they don't have Linux support, which is a big shame because uh, laptops would be very handy to have, um, especially when you're going around the place, you know. It's, um, this is as small as I could get, so <laughs> in a PC. That actually has the functionality we need, um, but yeah, and it also yeah it doesn't have its own backup power supply. So um, there's some links. So if you want to go to those places, um, and that's pretty much it. I think that's the last slide. Yes, it is. So I'll just go back on that. Uh, is there any questions you'd like to ask about this? Hello. Yes. Yeah. Um, just at the end, you mentioned USB three. Mm, yeah, you USB. Well, that's yeah, that's USB two, and it's say, cap, it's basically limiting the frame rate and then spitting it out as motion JPEG. Uh, USB three has the advantage that it actually can handle the bandwidth of a ten eighty p HDMI fifty sixty hertz stream. So the good thing is, if you're plugging a camera into uh, Tim's thing. And here's Tim now. Um, so he's basically going to get criticized. Basically, I'm criticizing your device at the moment. Um, <laughs> <it's> like, um, <laughs> basically, um, yeah, for cameras, I don't like the idea of, I mean, slides, yeah, I don't have any problem with that. I think that's a good device for slides. Of course, slides are never, you know, unless you're actually doing some live demo video or something like that. Frame rate's not an issue. I mean, those, if you've heard of like devices from a company called Epahan, which is a Canadian company, they make a USB to a VGA to USB adapter, which does the same thing essentially. It's basically limits the frame, it's basically lowers the frame rate um, to fit it over um, USB, USB 2. Um, but for slides, that's not a problem. But then it's VGA, that's a problem. And it's awfully expensive as well. So. Um, like they, they do have a DVI version and it's like a thousand dollars just for like a little adapter. So the thing about those Blackmagic cards, they're, um, just a sec, uh, they're, they're about 150 to 200 dollars. So they're a lot cheaper. Yeah, yes. Um, so when you're actually uh, saving the stream, I assume you're getting multiple inputs, can you save each of the inputs individually so you can compile them later? Or yes, yes, that's what's happening. Yes, um, the, the question was, um, when we save 
save the stream? Or, like, are we actually saving the stream? Is that correct? Are we actually into the, into the individual components? Yes. So we're saving the stream into the individual components. That was the question. Are we doing that? Yes. Yes, we're doing that. We're teeing it off um, before it goes through into DV switch and gets shrunk down to SD. So we're taking the, that HD, putting it onto the hard disk as well. So. Um, yeah, you need lots of hard disk for that, but it's not too bad. I mean, also, we are, with that, we, we are using H.264 with not very high options, so it's not really that taxing on it either. That's another thing we're actually encoding as well, but that's not a, too bad. Um, yeah, so, we, so it is a lossy format, because the reason is if we were capturing just completely raw, um, we would need so many hard disks. I mean, we've calculated this, it would take, I mean, it's something like, like just minutes, it'd be like multiple gigabytes of <laughs> for a minute. So, yeah, we're not doing that. We we are putting into a lossy format, but that's not really a big deal. That's yes. What is the storage architecture? What is the storage? Ah, the storage architecture is the Matterhorn server is a server with lots of disk, so it stores everything. Uh, these PCs only have enough storage to capture what they're going to capture for the duration of whatever the conference is. So generally we want to keep like a week's worth of videos on there. I mean, it's got a terabyte hard drive in it and that's generally, it's o that's okay if we're compressing it down with H.264. So it's, um, ba but basically they're all being then, when they're being processed also, they're also going to a server and then being basically processed into whatever formats they need to be for distribution to, um, you know, basically websites or YouTube or. So, so the individual streams are going they are. They are. Ah, the uh, they're not manually. They're all actually automatically reconciled. So what happens is the server, um, once the recording's finished, um, the capture agent, which is a little bit of software that glues, we, we've managed to glue in between the two, um, basically then just says, okay, that's finished. That that, like it has a uh, content ID and so it has an ID for that particular recording. It says this ID is finished now. Here's the video, it didn't, then it uploads it um, to the server. And then the server, based on what you've selected when you've scheduled the recording, because you can actually select different workflows, which are those XML files. So it'll say, okay, do the, do the YouTube and publish to our media module one. So then it'll just do with all its bits and spit it out to, um, spit it out to where you tell it to. So. Um, yeah, which is really good. So you don't, there's no, not really any manual intervention needed, uh, but you can manually upload if you wish. So just say it's offline, or you know, it's like you just record the video and then you want to upload it later, then you can, then you can just do that by taking the file and then scheduling a recording and then go manual upload and, and then tell it, tell it what workflow you want. So yeah, um, yeah, and basically. Have you thought of, um, since the manufacturer of those cards mm. in Melbourne, have you actually thought of maybe trying to work with them to convince them to open source their driver? Ah, uh, that's a, that would, um, no we haven't, but we have thought about asking them in terms of like getting some kind of support, you know, some kind of, I don't know, sponsorship support or something saying that we're using your products in this way, we can advertise your product and say that what a wonderful product it is to use for so we are w wanting to actually engage them because um, that might be an idea for PyCon AU, don't know. That's because we are, so yeah, that's because um, basically we're doing AV for PyCon AU, so next year. So um, I just want to just, I don't know if there's, is there enough time just to quickly just show one little thing? This is basically the media module. Sorry? This one? You don't okay. I just want to just quickly, yeah, I just want to just quickly, this is like, they had their own conference, and I'll just move this over to that screen, over here. But this is basically their own built-in media player. That's, it's Flash, but there is a HTML5 version now, which is good. Uh, and they also got a, an app for Android and iPhone as well, which is good, iOS. Uh, when I get my mouse over here. But what you can do with their built-in one, because it actually just saves the two individual streams, they're not mixed together. So, we can just play this, but you can do that, and that's the slides, but what you can, that's some neat little tools here that you can actually do that, or, that's cut off, so I can't, what you can basically do is you can either just have it like that, 
that or the opposite of. So you can have that small, that big, or just the slides. So, which is nice if you just want to focus on, and I think this has captions as well built into it, so, um, which are probably down here somewhere. Oh, and it also segments. There's an option in the workflows. You can segment it into different. So you can say, oh, I want to go to, say, that slide there. That looks nice. So it'll basically jump. Yeah, it's loading, but it'll jump to there. So you don't have to go watching through the video to find the part of the video you want, which is really nice if you want that information. But this is, was designed by, for universities for lectures, so that's why they want it like that. But yeah, I think that's, and the segment text as well. So you can get, because it OCRs it, so you can just go segment text. And yeah, see it's, um, basically you can just grab all the text out of it too. Or maybe not. But yeah, it's, that's the really cool thing about using its built-in player anyway. So yeah. <laughs> you didn't mention it, so I guess okay, Tim hadn't heard of it, but there's also a company called Ubicast mm. in France that does the G-Streamer conference for us. Oh, yeah. And they have a, a streaming platform. Oh, do they? And it has a couple of nice features like um, automatic detection of transitions on the slide. Feed, oh, okay. so that it'll automatically switch and show the slide for a couple of seconds before putting it back that's in the corner. Nice. That's Stuff nice. like that. That's really... Yeah. Okay, so they, they must just... Detect, um, like, like it must actually detect, like, a bit wide areas or something like yeah, that, yeah. That the slides are pretty static and just does... Yeah, that's what So if you play a video, it'll detect every frame's changing and put it up. Yeah, and it'll do, do weird stuff. Um, work mm. really well. So, okay. And all our G-Streamer conference talks end up online oh, from that. And mo uh, they, big chunks of their platform are, are open okay. as well. That's That's cool. Cool. Yeah. Okay. This is under the educational license, which I had a look at. It's actually a fairly reasonable license. It's like it allows you to make modifications and stuff and derivatives. So um, yeah, it's um, okay. As anyone else? No. Nope. Uh, one more. Just one thing. Yep. Does the black box devices support HDMI plugin protection? Uh, they do not. No, that's something that Blackmagic like, make very clear that um, they don't support that. Um, that's really only a problem if you're basically trying to play something. I mean, if someone tries to play a DVD or a Blu-ray or something during their talk, you can get around it apparently with splitters, but I wouldn't try that. <laughs> that's just dodgy. So, um, on the internet, yeah, you can buy a I, box that ha that has an HDMI in and an HDMI out, and that's magically, right, yeah, it, it just magically disappears. It just magically disappears. Yeah, that's that's also what you could use as well. But basically, for capturing lectures and stuff, that's not really an issue because people are just playing slides most of the time. If they're playing a video, we'd basically like to. I suppose you could just put before the conference, you know, any speakers wanting to play video, just tell us what it is first, so we can just make sure it doesn't black out the screen when it's. <laughs> Okay. Is there anything else? Anyone else? Uh, nope. Thank you. Okay. Not a problem. Mm, yeah, you USB. Well, that's. Yeah, that's USB two, and it's say, cap, it's basically limiting the frame rate and then spitting it out as motion JPEG. Uh, USB three has the advantage that it actually can handle the bandwidth of a ten eighty p HDMI fifty sixty hertz stream. So the good thing is, if you're plugging a camera into uh, Tim's thing, and here's Tim now, um, so he's basically going to get criticized. Basically, I'm criticizing your device at the moment. Um, <laughs> <it's> like, um, <laughs> basically, um, yeah, for cameras, I don't like the idea of, I mean, slides, yeah, I don't have any problem with that. I think that's a good device for slides. Of course, slides are never, you know, unless you're actually doing some live demo video or something like that, frame rate's not an issue. I mean, those, if you've heard of like devices from a company called Epahan, which is a Canadian company, they make a USB to, a VGA to USB adapter, which does the same thing essentially. It's basically limits the frame, it's basically lowers the frame rate um, to fit it over um, USB, USB 2. Um, but for slides, that's not a problem. But then it's VGA, that's a problem. And it's awfully expensive as well. So, um, like they, they do have a DVI version, and it's like $1,000 just for like a little adapter. So, the thing about those Blackmagic cards, they're, um, just to say, uh, they're, they're about $150 to $200. So, they're a lot cheaper. Yeah, yes. 
Yes. Yes, that's what's happening. Yes. Um, the, the question was um, when we save save the stream. Like, are we actually saving the stream? Is that correct? Are we actually into the individual components? Yes. So we're saving the stream into the individual components. That was the question. Are we doing that? Yes. Yes, we're doing that. We're teeing it off um, before it goes through into DV switch and gets shrunk down to SD. So we're taking the, that HD, putting it onto the hard disk as well. So. Um, yeah, you need lots of hard disk for that, but it's not too bad. I mean, also, we are, with that, we, we are using H.264 with not very high options, so it's not really that taxing on it either. That's another thing we're actually encoding as well, but that's not a, too bad. Um, yeah, so, we, so it is a lossy format, because the reason is if we were capturing just completely raw, um, we would need so many hard disks. I mean, we've calculated this, it would take, I mean, it's something like, like just minutes, it'd be like multiple gigabytes of <laughs> for a minute. So, yeah, we're not doing that. We we are putting into a lossy format, but that's not really a big deal. That's yes. What is the storage architecture? What is the storage? Ah, the storage architecture is the Matterhorn server is a server with lots of disk, so it stores everything. Uh, these PCs only have enough storage to capture what they're going to capture for the duration of whatever the conference is. So generally we want to keep like a week's worth of videos on there. I mean, it's got a terabyte hard drive in it and that's generally, it's o that's okay if we're compressing it down with H.264. So it's, um, ba but basically they're all being then, when they're being processed also, they're also going to a server and then being basically processed into whatever formats they need to be for distribution to, um, you know, basically websites or YouTube or. So, so the individual streams are going they are. They are. Ah, the uh, they're not manually. They're all actually automatically reconciled. So what happens is the server, um, once the recording's finished, um, the capture agent, which is a little bit of software that glues, we, we've managed to glue in between the two, um, basically then just says, okay, that's finished. That that, like it has a uh, content ID and it has an ID for that particular recording. It says this ID is finished now. Here's the video. It didn't, then it uploads it um, to the server, and then the server, based on what you've selected when you schedule the recording, because you can actually select different workflows, which are those XML files. So it'll say, okay, do the do the YouTube and publish to our media module one. So then it'll just do with all its bits and spit it out to um, spit it out to where you tell it to. So. Um, yeah, which is really good. So you don't, there's no, not really any manual intervention needed, uh, but you can manually upload if you wish. So just say it's offline, or you know, it's like you just record the video and then you want to upload it later, then you can, then you can just do that by taking the file and then scheduling a recording and then go manual upload and, and then tell it, tell it what workflow you want. So yeah, um, yeah, and basically. Have you thought of, um, since the manufacturer of those cards mm. in Melbourne, have you actually thought of maybe trying to work with them to convince them to open source their driver? Ah, uh, that's a, that would, um, no we haven't, but we have thought about asking them in terms of like getting some kind of support, you know, some kind of, I don't know, sponsorship support or something saying that we're using your products in this way, we can advertise your product and say that what a wonderful product it is to use for so we are w wanting to actually engage them because um, that might be an idea for PyCon AU, don't know. That's because we are, so yeah, that's because um, basically we're doing AV for PyCon AU, so next year. So um, I just want to just, I don't know if there's, is there enough time just to quickly just show one little thing? This is basically the media module. I just want to, I just want to just quickly, yeah, I just want to just quickly, this is like, they had their own conference, and I'll just move this over to that screen, over here. But this is basically their own built-in media player. That's, it's Flash, but there is a HTML5 version now, which is good. Uh, and they also got a, an app for Android and iPhone as well, which is good, iOS. Um, when I get my mouse over here. But what you can do with their built-in one, because it actually just saves the two individual streams, they're not mixed together. So, we can just play this. 
but you can do that. And that's the slides, but what you can, that's some neat little tools here that you can actually do that, or that's cut off, so I can't. Uh, what you can basically do is you can either just have it like that, that, or the opposite of. So you can have that small, that big, or just the slides. So, which is nice if you just want to focus on, and I think this has captions as well built into it, so, um, which are probably down here somewhere. Oh, and it also segments. There's an option in the workflows. You can segment it into different. So you can say, oh, I want to go to, say, that slide there. That looks nice. So it'll basically jump. Yeah, it's loading, but it'll jump to there. So you don't have to go watching through the video to find the part of the video you want, which is really nice if you want that information. But this is, was designed by, for universities for lectures, so that's why they want it like that. But yeah, I think that's, and the segment text as well. So you can get, because it OCRs it. So you can just go segment text. And yeah, see it's, um, basically you can just grab all the text out of it too. I believe, or maybe not. But yeah, it's, that's the really cool thing about using its built-in player anyway, so yeah. <laughs> Mm. Branch that does the conference for us. Oh, yeah. And they have a, a platform. Oh, do they? And it has a couple of nice features like um, automatic detection of transitions on the slide feed oh, okay. so that it'll automatically switch and show the slide for a couple of seconds before putting it back That's in the corner. Nice. That's Stuff nice. like that. That's really yeah. okay. So they must just detect, um, like, like it must actually detect, like, a bit wide areas or something like yeah, that. Yeah. That the slides are pretty static and just does yeah, this. So if you play a video, it'll detect every frame's changing and put it up. Yeah, and then it'll do, do weird stuff. Um, works mm. really well. So, okay. And all our GStreamer conference talks end up online okay. from that. And mo uh, they, big chunks of their platform are, are open okay. as well. That's safe. So cool. yeah. This is under the educational license, which I had a look at. It's actually a fairly reasonable license. It's like, it allows you to make modifications and stuff and derivatives, so. Um, yeah, it's, um, okay, as anyone else? Nope. Uh, one more, just one thing. Yep. Does the black box devices support HDMI copy protection? Uh, they do not. No, that's something that Blackmagic like, make very clear that um, they don't support that. Um, that's really only a problem if you're basically trying to play something. I mean, if someone tries to play a DVD or a Blu-ray or something during their talk, you can get around it apparently with splitters, but I wouldn't try that. <laughs> that's just dodgy. So. Um, the internet. Yeah, you can buy a I, box that ha that has an HDMI in and an HDMI out, and that's magically, right, yeah, it, it, just magically it disappears. It just, it just magically disappears. disappears. Yeah, that's that's also what you could use as well. But basically, for capturing lectures and stuff, that's not really an issue because people are just playing slides most of the time. If they're playing a video, we'd basically like to. I suppose you could just put before the conference, you know, any speakers wanting to play video, just tell us what it is first, so we can just make sure it doesn't black out the screen when it's. <laughs> Okay, is there anything else? Anyone else? Uh, nope. Thank you. Okay, not a problem.